Welcome to the Command Post Podcast, powered by First Do. I'm your host, Tom Lewis, First Do's Director of Training. I am pleased today to welcome industry legend Gordon Graham to the podcast. Mr. Gordon Graham is a 33-year veteran, now retired, of California law enforcement. In this capacity, he served as a street cop, supervisor, manager, and executive. Mr. Graham was awarded a BA in business from San Francisco State College, a teaching credential from California State University, Long Beach, a master's degree in safety and systems management from the University of Southern California, and a Juris Doctorate from Western State University. He has taken his background as a cop, risk manager, and attorney, and is the co-founder of Lexapol, a company designed to standardize public safety practices around America. He has presented to personnel from around the world. I am grateful to have Gordon Graham, co-founder of both Lexapol and firefightercloscalls.com on the podcast today. Let's get it started. Good morning, Gordon Graham. How are you this morning? 100% Tom, how about you? I'm doing terrific. I am honored and uh, very grateful to have you here on the Command Post podcast today. Well, thanks for the invitation. Looking forward to this. Yeah, likewise. So you always impart wisdom wherever you go. So what what's on your mind lately? What's what's something that you're you've been passionate about? I know we're going to talk to you about a legacy project that you have, but what what what's what's kind of got under your gander lately? <laughs> uh, how long do we have? <laughs> yeah. You know, if I was a kid today growing up, they'd have me on Ritalin and heroin. Uh, my brain is all over the place. And, um, you know, focusing. And as I get older, I find this um, more often. Focusing is difficult sometimes. But, you know, on my mind, Russia, Ukraine, China, Tehran, uh, North Korea, EMPs, food shortage water shortage you know there's a lot of stuff going on uh, there is. specific to the world of public safety you know i worry about my side of the fence the law enforcement side uh the increased violence against cops around the country decreasing in funding uh anti-police rhetoric people who really have no clue what they're talking about still talking uh, on the fire mm -hmm. side of things i have great concerns and i think that's why i'd like to start today uh you okay. mentioned my my legacy project. And this is what I'm focused on right now. Um, let me start with this, and it'll seem a little bit incongruent, but hopefully it'll tie together. So Perfect. we had Ferguson, Missouri, eight years ago, 2014. And even though you're on the fire side of things, you're familiar with Ferguson, Missouri. Um, since Ferguson, I have talked to 40 different chiefs of police groups. Uh, every year, International Association of Chiefs of Police, I've been a speaker there every year National Sheriff's Association. And every year, every place I go, I ask the chiefs of police this question, how many of you have read the Ferguson reports? And most recently in a pretty major state, 300 chiefs of police in this room, how many hands do you think went up? Three. And all of them Three. black hands. Three. Three. Out of how many in the room? 300. And all of them African-American chiefs of police. So the only people who learned the lessons from the Ferguson, Missouri, were African-American chiefs of police? Huh. Huh. You know, Gordon, this is a fire contract, a uh, uh, fire event. You need to talk about the fire service. Okay. Walk up to any firefighter outside of the D.C. area and ask, what were the lessons learned out of the Cherry Road townhouse fire that caused the deaths of firefighters Matthews and Phillips in Washington, D.C.? You get a blank stare. Blank stare. Yeah. Walk up to any firefighter outside of Ohio and ask, so what were the lessons learned out of the Coleraine Township fire that killed Captain Brockstrom and Firefighter Shira? Ohio, right? Stare. Ohio. I walk up to any firefighter outside of uh, New York and ask, well, how about the Father's Day hardware store fire that killed firefighters Ford, Fahey, and Downing? And you'll get a blank stare. Gordon, are you trying to make a point here? You walk up to any pilot and mention the name Sullenberger, and that pilot will tell you exactly, precisely how to land a plane on the Hudson River. My point is this, the learning management system in the aviation community is much more robust than what we have in public safety. And I will give you this up front, your learning management system in the fire service is better than we have what we have in law enforcement, but even yours needs a lot of improvement. The learning management system we keep on making the same mistakes 
over and over and over again. And while I've never done your job, I'm fed up with the deaths. I'm fed up with the injuries. I'm fed up with the bagpipes. I'm fed up with the folded flags. I am fed up. And do not leave this broadcast today saying, yeah, the guy's not a firefighter. What's he know? Bad things are just going to happen, and there's nothing we can do about it. Well, hopefully, hopefully next year when the book gets published, the 30 fires you need to know by my good friend, Chief Billy Goldfeder and uh, Chief Frank Lee from New York, obviously the FDNY. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you will buy that book and get the lessons out of those 30 fires. Currently, Chief Goldfeder's got three books on, the Pass It On series, where he talks about probably a hundred different events in those Pass It On. There are lessons learned there. Let me start off with this. Black swans versus gray rhinos. Okay. If you're really interested in this, you can visit my love website, lexapole.com forward slash presentations, and download my recommended rating list. Obviously, I'm biased. It's all books on risk management. But here's two great books for you to read, The Black Swan by Nassa Nicholas Taleb and The Gray Rhino by Michelle Wucker. Take them one at a time. Taleb's great book, 1597. This Englishman goes down to Australia and he sees this big black bird that looks like a swan. But in his world where he comes from, swans are white. So he asked the Aussie guy, what kind of bird is that? It's a black swan, mate. To the Englishman, that was an unknown unknown something he had never considered, the possibility of a black swan. Fast forward to 21 years ago, one month after uh, yeah. September 11, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, and he passed away last year. This is in his obituary. You look up the obituary of Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, and this is in there. One month after September 11, he was asked this question by the news media, what's your greatest fear on this war on terror? His response? My greatest fear are the black swans, the unknown unknowns, the things we haven't even thought about yet. On the other hand, Michelle Walker's got this great book, The Gray Rhino. These massive 4,000 pound beasts that are running right at us. We can see them coming and we refuse to get out of the way. By the end of this broadcast, I want to convince you that even though I'm the outside idiot, there are very few black swans in your profession. Most of the tragedies, your deaths, your injuries, your embarrassments, your criminal indictments, your lawsuits, your lack of public trust, these things are not sneaking up on the fire service. They are not sneaking up on law enforcement. These are coming right at us. We can see them coming and we refuse to get out of the way. Black swans versus gray rhinos. You asked about it, Tom. The title of my legacy project is this. Your black swan is somebody else's gray rhino. Mm -hmm. Just because it hasn't happened in your department doesn't mean it hasn't happened in your profession. We've got to learn from the tragedies in the past. There's no new ways to get in trouble, folks. Planes have figured out no new ways to crash. Restaurants have figured out no new ways to poison people. Uh, mines have figured out no new ways to collapse. Cops have figured out no new ways to get in trouble. Firefighters, there's no new ways to get in trouble. Oh, there are variations on a theme, but it's the same stuff over and over and over again. And my goal is to create a learning management system, quite frankly, that makes the aviation learning management system look like chump change. And I've got a seven-step approach, and I spent a lot of my time working on that seven-step approach to make the knowledge of all, what everybody knows, everyone will know. So sorry about rambling there, Tom. But no, it's not rambling. So, that stuff. No, it's not rambling at all. So when we talk about um, when we talk about the black swans, gray rhinos, and you mentioned something too, the the tragic the tragic gray rhinos, the ones that are going to cause a line of duty death, the ones that are going to cause a serious serious injury or illness within the department. We get those. Before you go into like the seven steps, give some examples of less extreme gray rhinos that can cause some pain for a fire department, whether it's pain in the form of embarrassment, whether it's pain in the form of something costly, because I, th I think we can wrap our heads pretty good around the line of duty deaths and things that are just, just sentinel events for any, any kind of agency. But what are those, what are some of those gray rhinos that are gonna come at you from the, you know, from the side and blindside you? Oh, well, you know, 
I, I, I don't know if they're going to blindside us, but they happen all too often. Okay. So when I came in law enforcement, you heard the introduction, 1973, there was very few women cops in law enforcement back in 1973. By 1983, more and more women were choosing the career of law enforcement. And by 85, we had more and more issues regarding sexual harassment. So I was active on the lecture circuit back in 85, and I put together a class, Sexual Harassment Techniques for Elimination. And it was a four-hour block. And between 85 and 95, I taught the class one way. And in 1995, I had a brilliant idea. I've got a new way to teach my sex harassment class. And I tried it for about a month, maybe two months. And I got in so much trouble for doing it the new way. I had to go back and do it the old way. So I don't do it the new way anymore. But I'll tell you what I did for about two months back in 1995 that got me in a lot of trouble. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Gordon Graham here. I've got you for four hours on sex harassment techniques for elimination. Let's get started. And I would reach into my tax deductible briefcase and pull out a stack of three by five cards. And I would walk around the room, handing them out at random. One for you, one for you, one over here, two over here. And you can hear people talking. This ain't random. He's just giving it to the women. And I get back up front. Ladies, would you take a look around the room right now? and write down the name of the biggest sexual predator in this room right now. Oh. By the way, if you're going to do this, you get your cash up front because they are not going to pay you after the fact. <laughs> so the women are writing. A minute later, I go around and pick up the cards. Now, to be fair, most of the cards were blank. But when I did see a name written down on a card where some woman had the guts to write a name down on the card, did I see that name repeated on other cards in the same stack? Yep. Mm. I up to the chief. Hey, chief. What? Good news, sir. Not your name. I'll sell you these cards for $50,000. And you can see a thinking, well, we can take it out of asset seizure and forfeiture money. And I tear the cards up and throw them away. My guess is, chief, you don't need to buy them. My guess is, what? You already know. Mm. When was the last time? A sex harassment lawsuit was filed against a fire department or a police department where people sat around after the fact and said, what? who would have ever thought? Most of the time, people are saying, that's been going on for years. Everybody knew and nobody did a darn thing about it. You know, vehicle operations. I got a four-hour block on vehicle operations in law enforcement agencies Everybody gets a three by five card at eight o'clock in the morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Gordon Graham here. I've got you for four hours on vehicle operations. In front of you, you see a set of handout materials and the three by five card. Would you please take a look around the room right now and write down the name of the next cop who's going to stack up a patrol car? The next cop who's in this room right now who's going to wreck a sled. In every police department, does every cop know? who the next cop is who's going to wreck the sled. Yep. Mm. Do the dispatchers know who's going to stack up a patrol car? Yep. Do the mechanics know who's going to stack up the patrol car? Up oh, pads and rotors every 300 miles. I saw that one coming. Everybody knows and nobody's doing a darn thing about it. And why? Why? On my recommended reading, That's... there's a great book called Willful Blindness by Margaret Heffernan. Brilliant author. Chapter one, she sums it all up. Why don't people raise their hands and report these problems lying in wait? Chapter one of her book, in too many organizations, if you raise your hand and say, we got a problem, in the eyes of many people in the organization, what? You're the problem. So don't raise your hand. And this is particularly acute in government operations. Mm. And the fire service is a government operation. Sure. Because if you raise your hand to take that risk, you get paid X. If you don't do jack and ignore the rest, you get paid how much? X. So why raise your hand? And as a result, in too many organizations, mediocrity has replaced accountability and the whole house of cards starts to fall apart. And sooner or later, all the holes in the Swiss cheese will get lined up. You'll have the triggering event followed by the tragedy. And then the lawyers get involved and the news media gets involved. And they use the Public Records Act and pretrial discovery to peel back the layers of the onion 
and they identify all these problems lying in wait that people knew about or should have known about, and nobody did a darn thing about it. And I'm fed up, folks. Now, the two examples I gave you, sex harassment and vehicle operations, well, Gordon, those things are relatively benign. No, in your organization, you've had suicides. You have had suicides by women firefighters, suicides because of the ongoing barrage of inappropriate behavior in the workplace that everybody knew about and nobody did a darn thing about it. Vehicle operations, oh, yeah, we can laugh when a cop wrecks a patrol car, but when they get ejected because they're not wearing a seatbelt, all of a sudden it's not so funny anymore, is it? Or they this take out a civilian. Stuff, folks. We've yeah, got they take these out a problems civilian. lying in wait. We've got to address them. Yeah, or they take out a civilian. It's not so funny anymore. Yep. What? Yep. Uh, yeah, I know. Well, even at FRI coming up in San Antonio, Fire Rescue International, they're going to have, there's a, they, uh, on the secret list, Billy's secret list, they, they talked about a class. There's going to be a seminar on bullying in the fire service, right? Bullying. Yep. Uh, you know, those, those recognizing it, managing it, that, that sounds to me like a gray rhino. Oh, it's obvious as that. I was doing some work in the commercial real estate world and a, uh, a fellow in the class uh, came up to me and he said, my son was 10 years old on September 11th, 2001. And on that day, he vowed he wanted to be a firefighter. He bought every book he could buy on fire service operations. When he turned 15, he started hanging out at fire stations. He started learning how to be that firefighter cadet. And then he focused on firefighting in his junior college work. And he did this and he did this. He ate, he slept, he dreamt being a firefighter. And when he turned 21, he became a firefighter. I'm not naming the agency. He became a firefighter. And it's a pretty substantial agency. And okay. uh, I said, how's he doing today? He quit on probation. He quit on probation. Wow. I said, what happened? He said, the captain in that station had the probationaries naked on their hands and their knees, going around doing the grout with toothbrushes. Naked on their hands and knees. This is 10 years ago. Naked on their hands and knees, going around doing grout. And he said, this is not what I signed up for. This bullying in the fire service, it's an acute problem. This is not sneaking up on us. This is not a black swan. This is a gray rhino. And people wonder, well, why aren't people joining the fire service? I know why they're not joining law enforcement. But I'll tell you, in the fire service, there's a history of bullying in a lot of departments. And you're missing out on a lot of good people. We're missing out on a lot of good people because of that. Well, I know we're going to go down the seven, the seven steps. We have to talk about that. But just address, in your opinion, address... I remembered when I tested for my fire academy, it was a high, you, you were lucky if you got in, in the, on your first attempt and it was highly competitive, thousands uh, uh, going for it, you know, whittled down to hundreds, then down to a 30 or so for a typical academy. I know that, you know, every everywhere around the country is a little bit different, but it was uber competitive and it's, I've always felt it's a noble profession as is, as is law enforcement. So what's going on that even career departments are having to do heavy recruiting? I mean, what is that? Well, it's pretty obvious on the on the police side. All the hate, all the yeah. negativity, all sure. the vitriol, all the name calling, you know, and all the murders. You know, that that's pretty obvious. What's going on on the fire side? Well, let's address the volunteer side first of all. Sure. On my sure. recommended reading list is a great book called Bowling Alone. I think the author's name is Frank Putnam, and when he wrote the book. Bowling was up. More people were bowling than ever before in America. However, bowling leagues were down. While the sport of bowling was up, leagues were down. Everybody was doing it individually or with a friend, bowling alone. I can recall Christmas parties on the California Highway Patrol, Christmas parties back in the 70s and the 80s. That was the big event. Yeah. There was five offices in Los Angeles City, East L.A., West L.A., South L.A., Glendale, and the backbone of the California Highway Patrol, Central Los Angeles, where I worked for my first 20 years. And each of those offices had to schedule their Christmas parties a year in advance, because when Central had a Christmas party, everybody went. South L.A. had to come up and cover our South End. 
East LA had to come in and cover the East End. West LA had to come in and handle the West End. Glendale had to come down and handle the North End of our area. Do we do that anymore? There's more Christmas parties. You know, the big event is now not an event. Everybody is running parallel. People are not interacting. So there's more volunteerism in America than I've ever seen before. I think there's data to support that. But volunteering individually, not in a group setting. And that's what I think the problem is in the volunteer fire service. Interesting. And, and I think we have to give some tax benefits or some education benefits or some benefit to get people who have to go through, in most states, I understand, the requirements to be a volunteer are almost as severe as the requirements to be a full-time paid firefighter. And if that's true, why would people want to do that? There's going to have to be some incentives in there to benefit that. In law enforcement, I don't know what the answer is. I do not know what the answer is. And it's even worse. Today's Wall Street Journal has a big article on Seattle Police Department. Seattle PD is paying $30,000 for lateral hires, $7,500 for brand new hires. The sheriff of uh, uh, sheriff of Spokane County, Ozzy Knizmich, a good friend of mine, he's got billboards in Seattle. If you want to get away from all this nonsense you're putting up with in <laughs> Seattle, come on out to Spokane County where you'll get treated as a real cop. You know? So I understand the problems on our side of the fence. But on your side of the fence, the volunteers were in big trouble. Big and trouble. even even fire departments were in big trouble. Yes. The New York Fire Department, I read, is lowering their educational standards, lowering their physical fitness standards to increase the re recruitment pool. You know, every time you lower standards to increase the size of the pool, you're going to pay for that downstream. Yeah. We have got to revisit the way we recruit. In a long program, I talk about the key role of everyone in the fire service in being a recruiter. Every day, you have an opportunity to identify your replacement. If everybody in the fire service made it their goal to find one good woman, one good man in their career, that would help to keep up with attrition. One a year, you'd have a wide applicant pool. One a month, you'd have an applicant pool 12 times that size. I know I do that quickly. I went to Catholic school. If everybody did it once a day, 10 times a month, if you found one good woman, one good man, and got them interested in a career with the fire service, You'd have that wide, broad, deep applicant pool where you can pick and choose among the best of the best and get what you need. Top-notch people and top-notch people from your community. I'll bore you with this. This is not a class I teach. This is a way of life. So, my gosh, a dozen years ago, I got off an airplane in Chicago and I drove down to normal Illinois. As a frequent flyer, I'll give you a tip. You can fly through uh, to Chicago. You can fly from Chicago. But only stupid people try to fly through Chicago. Chicago's <laughs> got all sorts of delays. So I don't take regionals out of Chicago. If I got to get to uh, normal Illinois, I fly to O'Hare and I drive down to normal. If I got to get to Oshkosh, Wisconsin, I fly to O'Hare and I drive up around the lake. So I got this drive. I get down to normal Illinois at one o'clock in the morning. It's snowing outside. I come walking in. And here's a woman behind the counter at the Holiday Inn in normal Illinois. And she's, I walk in the lobby, it's snowing like heck outside, and she's got this big smile on her face, and she says, you must be Gordon Graham. And I said, how do you know that? She goes, I've got one more customer to check in, and here you are. How are you tonight, sir? And I said, everything's good. Nice young lady, big smile. Nice. I'm looking at her desk, school books, school books. She's got books out, she's got a yellow marker out, she's got a notebook out. This is the future of the California Highway Patrol, this young woman right here. She's working all night and going to school all day long. My heart's out to her. So I said, so what are you studying? Oh, uh, hospitality management. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I really like working with people. Blah, 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 blah. You know what? Have you ever thought about joining the California Highway Patrol? And she looks at me, what? <laughs> She's I said, in Chicago, you know, I Illinois. For the CHP. I was retired at the point, but I still recruit for them. And it's a great job. Of, 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 of. And by the way, that white stuff out there floating down, you will never have to experience that again in your life. And she got a couple laughs out of it. Very professional young lady. You know, I checked out the next morning. She wasn't there. Did my work. Flew home. Ten years later. Ten years later. I'm in my office. My wife and I were going out to lunch. Our secretary is there. Phone rings. Graham Research Consultants. Can I help you? Yes. Yes. Uh, one moment, please. Gordon, there's a woman on line one that says she met you in a hotel a couple of years ago and she wants to talk to you. 
Oh, that sounds really good. Oh, uh -oh. She met me in a hotel. Right. Put it on speakerphone. Put it on speakerphone. You probably don't remember me, but you met me in normal Illinois, blah, 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 blah. I do remember you. She goes, well, I graduate the academy uh, later on this year, and I, I just wanted to let you know. And I said, I go to every CHP graduation. I will see you there. She goes, oh, no, I didn't go with the California Highway Patrol. I went with Chicago Police Department. Hmm. Is that good for me? Is that good for our profession? Sure. Don't recruit for your department. Recruit for your profession. You hmm. summed it up. It's a very noble profession. I have that a program is. I teach called the 10 Fs. You want to live a long time, not just length of life, but quality of life. Family, faith, friends, food, fun, fun, fitness, function, freedom, and fulfillment. And fulfillment in the fire service. Every day you work in the fire service, you have an opportunity to make a positive difference in somebody's life. A positive difference in somebody's so life. So true. A lot of people can't do that, folks. you got a great job. Advertise it, market it, and get that next generation of firefighters to replace you if and when you leave. You know, one thing when when, I, when people ask me about the fire service, I say, well, it is the fire, the fire service, but you got to love people and you're going to, you better love EMS because that's what we do 90% of the time, EMS and the calls that, you know, you either roll your eyes and go, okay, three in the morning, you know, we're going to pick up Mrs. Smith off the floor, but you know what? You're making profound impact in people's lives with the little gestures you do. It's not just the big calls that make a difference. I know I'm not supposed to date these uh, podcasts and these webinars, but in today's Fire Rescue One is an article from a uh, an opinion piece by a fire chief, why he introduces himself as the EMS chief and the fire chief, not the fire EMS, but the EMS fire, because the numbers are very clear. In his department, it was well over 90% of their calls were the EMS runs, you know, and sure. that every day you get one of those calls, you have got an opportunity to make that positive impact on somebody's life. Yeah, and you've got the departments renaming themselves. They're calling themselves Mesa Fire and Medical, Rio Rico Fire and Medical. Yeah. You know, they're they're adding the mission into the title. But the fire service, having the fire in our middle name, you know, as, as our middle name, gets you in the door. It it opens it it opens things up. It's our response capabilities, and so it'll. Thank God it will always be there because there will always be fires. But our mission has con and continually evolved as we demonstrate value to our communities. Right, Alan Bernasini summed it all up. All risks, all risks, all risks, you know, not just the fire, not just the EMS, but you've got to prepare for all the risks your community is going to face. 100%. And in a long program, the external risks, the legal and regulatory risks, strategic risks, organizational risks, operational risks, information risks, technology risks, HR risks, financial and reputational risks, political risks. There's a lot of risks out there, but facing those head on, that's what the fire service leaders have got to be able to do. Even with fewer fires, there's going to be plenty of work to do as long as you know what you're going to be getting into, that it isn't going to be backdraft or Chicago fire, the, the TV shows. It That'll be maybe that'll happen occasionally, but your day to day routine is going to be far more mundane, but far more in the, in the, in the spirit and in the true sense of service. Absolutely. So let's let's talk about these seven steps. Well, seven steps. Uh, I'll name them off very quickly. Number one, we need better investigations. Number two, we need to learn from the investigations. Number three, we need to learn from investigations outside of our high-risk industries. Number four, we need to learn from close calls. Number five, we need to capture institutional knowledge before it leaves our department. Number six, we need to bring back institutional knowledge that's already left the department. And number seven, we need to build a robust training program where every day is a training day focusing on the events in that specific job that are overrepresented in tragedy. So all let's right. get started with this. Number okay, one. And those, se those seven, again, just for, for our listeners, those seven, are it's all about the black swans and the gray rhinos Yep. and how you're going to head them off at the pass. Yep. How you're going to make the knowledge of all, what the organism, excuse me, what the profession knows, everybody's going to know. So we don't make those same mistakes over and over and over again. Let's go through let's, those seven. Let's do it. Number one. Better investigations. So I got involved back in 2010, 2011 with two dads whose sons were killed by cops. Different parts of the country, sons were killed by cops. What caught my eye is how they said, oh, my son was murdered by the police. Well, I wasn't there. You weren't there. We know your son is dead. 
but there's a big difference between murder and being killed. So in order to satisfy my own curiosity, I used the Public Records Act and I got copies of the final investigations on these two use of deadly force events. And I did the quote mark investigation because they weren't investigations. They were not even reports. These things were terrible, poorly written. And, you know, I, I could not calm down these dads, but both of them were Air Force veterans. And they said, you know what law enforcement needs is you need an NTSB approach, National Transportation Safety Board approach to the investigation of use of deadly force, where you get beyond the proximate cause and look for what really led up to this particular event. Identify the root cause. And if you've read any of the NTSB reports, I'm not being rude here, just very blunt. Kobe Bryant is in the news right now. There's a trial going on in Los Angeles regarding firefighters and cops taking pictures on scene mm -hmm. and releasing these pictures to friends, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a real big deal. It's still on the news. There's a final report out on Kobe Bryant. You can read it. You can read it. But I'm not being rude here, just very blunt. If the fire department would have investigated that or if the police department would have investigated that, the final report would have been the helicopter flew into a hill in bad weather. Everybody died. Well, that's your proximate cause. What the NTSB does is they go back in time and they take a look at hours. How many hours to the pilot? Hours of training, uh, maintenance of the airship, building the airship, required equipment, blah, 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 blah. They look for the real problems lying in wait that people knew about or should have known about. You know, identifying the root cause, not just the proximate cause. Okay. And right now, we are looking at the proximate cause and not looking for what really caused it. One of my pet peeves is this whole issue of public safety fatigue. Public safety fatigue. You know, if you're not getting seven hours of uninterrupted sleep every night, you're suffering from fatigue. Long-term fatigue, short-term fatigue, gross fatigue, pettit fatigue, cumulative fatigue. Does fatigue impact decision-making, coordination and balance? Uh, vision, lifespan, judgment, disposition? The answer to all of the above is yes. Now, in some fire departments, you can get away with it because you don't have a high call volume. But you look at some of the majors, Los Angeles City, where those paramedics are running 24 hours a day. Holy moly, at the end of 24 hours, study after study after study has shown us you're the functional equivalent of a 0 0.10 blood alcohol level DUI. Now, nobody would want to work with a drunk driver. Why would you want to work with a fatigued paramedic? We've got to take a look at what really is causing these problems. Your aviation team inside your fire department, if you're New York fire or LA fire, you've got an aviation unit. I guarantee you there are no 24-hour shifts in the aviation unit. They've got their hours, and when they're up against their hours, they don't fly, period, end of story. We need to bring that line of thinking into our business. Number one, we need better investigations. I got with these two dads, and I met them halfway. I said, I will support you on better investigations for use of deadly force if you will support me for better investigations on line of duty deaths, because we are not learning from these line of duty deaths. I love odmp.org, Officer Down Memorial page. They're a good bunch of people, but their job is just reporting, not investigating. And what do you learn there? Officer ran off road. Officer was assassinated. Officer, you know, that's what the proximate cause is. I want to know what the real problems are that are lying in wait, that are leading up these events. You made the mistake of inviting me here, Tom, so I will worry with this. When I was in graduate school, and what people remember from the introduction, oh, he's some uh, motorcycle cop who became a lawyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More important to me than law school was graduate school, where I did three years at the Institute of Safety and Systems Management. You can Google it. I know we don't have time today. The ISSM at University of Southern California fascinating, fascinating program, no longer exists. That's another story. But it was a program designed to educate military leaders on the principles of risk. It was established in 1950. 25 years later, I entered that program. And during that three-year window, I got hooked on the study of tragedy. One of the things I learned is the naval aviators at the time had to fill out a checklist every day. And if you scored more than 30 points on this checklist, you weren't flying. Guess what? A divorce was 30 points. If Yikes. you're going through a divorce, you are not flying today. You are distracted. A sick kid was two points. You ready for this? 
refinancing your house was a half a point. Okay. Somebody had done a data wow. analysis and they had looked at these crashes involving naval aviators and they said, okay, what were the commonalities here? And they had a checklist. There was like 20 items on this checklist and each one had a point value. If you scored more than 30 points, you weren't flying that day. And what I found very, uh, not funny because it's not funny, but divorce was 30 points. Clearly you are not thinking about anything other yeah. than that event. You're not flying. So the, they, they figured it out. We need something similar in our organization. We need to address these problems lying in the way. And you know what? If you're overloaded today, maybe you shouldn't be working today. Why is there a stigma about all this rest? We talk about, you know, because we're such a workaholic, it seems like society, but there always seems to be a stigma that you're, you know, oh, I got nine hours of sleep last night or 10 hours of sleep last night and you're somehow a slacker. I don't, you know, you know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? It seems I, to be- I learned how perception. old you were when our, our preparation for this. So you might be too young for this, but there was a time when firefighters had leather lungs. Do you remember those days? I, 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 I was, that was before my time, but I know the term. Yep. We don't need breathing apparatus. We don't need breathing apparatus. We've got leather lungs. Well, how'd yeah. that work out for you? You know, it's cops not wearing seatbelts. Arrogance, ignorance, and complacency. Arrogance. I'm not doing it. Ignorance. Ah, I don't know if it works. Complacency. We've been doing it this way for years. Haven't had a problem yet. Here's a little observation for you. It's a cop question for you. What's the difference between robbery and extortion? I don't expect you to know this, so I'll give you the answer. Time. Mm. Robbery is give me your money right now. Extortion is I steal from you over a period of time. Okay. What's the difference between a cop making a mistake and a firefighter making a mistake? In the cop world, if you make a mistake, you're going to be dead right then. In the fire service, you make mistakes. It's cumulative. Over a period of years, it will all add up. You can get away without wearing your breathing apparatus today and tomorrow and the next day, but that stuff is all adding up. You can get away with not inspecting your turnout gear on a regular basis and keeping it clean, but all that stuff is cumulative. It is adding up. You can get away with not doing these things, but sooner or later, it's going to haunt you. It's a matter of time. You've got to understand what the rules are and respect those rules. Yeah, and especially it's in the rules you're talking about too, if not to get into the weeds too much here, but when you think about uh, wearing your SCBA, I think generally speaking, we're wearing our SCBAs pretty good when it comes to fighting fire. It's the overhaul and the investigation afterwards where we're not wearing it. Yeah. So, yep. you know, it's still Fire's done. Fire's yeah. done. Well, you know, I learned this from Alan Bernasini when he told me all smoke is poison. I had never considered that. Mm. To me, in my little cop brain, the darker the smoke was, the worse it was for you. In his world, all smoke is poison. And yeah. I brought that concept into my daily training bulletins way back in 1985. All smoke is poison. The toughest thing about the whole field of risk management that I'm in, did anybody live because of that? I'm hopeful somebody did. That said, oh, you know what? I never gave that any thought. All smoke is poison. And maybe they change behaviors to avoid smoke, but you sure. never know what the thing is. But step one on our seven step approach is yep. we need better investigations. And I'm a big fan of the NTSB approach on that. Really get beyond the proximate cause and look for the real problems lying in wait. Now, some of you are thinking, well, Gordon, we have NIOSH. We have NIOSH to do our investigations. You do. But my understanding is, and correct me if you're wrong, NIOSH only comes in at the invitation of the fire chief. Is that an accurate statement? I believe that's true. Yeah. So if I'm a fire chief and I've got a laissez-faire operation where I don't take training seriously and I don't take SCBA seriously and I don't take rules seriously because I want to be popular, I want people to like me for not enforcing the rules, and all of a sudden I've got a dead firefighter, am I going to invite NIOSH in? Oh, heck no. Because they're going to come back and peel back the layers of the onion and say these are the problems lying in wait. So NIOSH is a good tool, but only if they're used properly. What I really like about NIOSH is number two on my seven steps. Okay. Step one, we need better investigation. I think NIOSH does the better investigation. Step two, we need to learn from these investigations. 
in the law enforcement world, look at these 500 page AARs, after action reviews. Does anybody ever read those things? In there, there are nuggets of information, nuggets of gold. What NIOSH does is they put the lessons learned right up front on these reports. And then they refer you to the pages where you can read more about the lessons learned. In law enforcement, the lessons learned are buried there. So you have a leg up on law enforcement in terms of when NIOSH gets invited in, they do a good job and those lessons learned are there for a reason. We need to learn from those lessons. You'll note that Goldfeder on his website, firefightercloscalls.com, he takes all those NIOSH reports and puts a link to them. If I was a fire captain, if I had a crew of people working for me, every day we'd review one of those. We would review one of those lessons learned off closecalls.com, something prepared by NIOSH. And by the way, I met a woman about a month ago uh, who was with NIOSH, and I complimented her on the quality of the work they did in the fire service, and she got it. She understood how critical her role is in peeling back the layers of the onion. Sometimes you're not popular when you do that. What do these people know? They're not firefighters. They're looking at factual data and they're sure. reporting it. Some people find that uncomfortable, and that's too bad. That's step two, is learning from investigations. Step one, better investigations. Step okay. two, learning from investigations. Step three, learning from tragedies in other high-risk industries. The aviation community. Yeah. You know, I think, I'm, I'm not a pilot, but I think I could fly an airplane based on my study of tragedies in the aviation industry. You know, they have a very uh, intricate system of investigations and reporting, uh, including step four, the close call reporting, which we'll get to in a little bit. But you can learn a lot from reading these aviation investigations, investigations in the medical industry. Why are doctors killing so many people? Investigations in the uh, power line industry. Boy, I learned a piece of data recently uh, out of Washington State. Add up all the cops in Washington State who die in a year. Add up all the firefighters in Washington State who die in a year. Add them together. That number is smaller than the number of linemen, people stringing power lines, who die. And it's it's not a gray rhino. Excuse me, not a black swan. It's a gray rhino. When the power lines go down, they are working 24-hour shifts, 48-hour shifts to get them back up. And there's the F word again popping up. Gross fatigue. People are more likely to make a mistake. And if you make enough mistakes, sooner or later, it's going to end up in a tragedy. So, number one, we need better investigations. Number two, we need to learn from these investigations. Number three, we need to learn from investigations outside of our industry. Outside of our industry. Number four, learning from close calls. Close calls. So, I mentioned my work in graduate school, and I hope this comes across to you. Uh, on the, uh, the live feed. But I got introduced to a fellow in graduate school called H.W. Heinrich. H.W. Heinrich, oddly enough, Dr. Kern's great book, Going Pro, The Deliberate Practice of Professionalism. He talks about H.W. Heinrich. I had not heard anybody except for me referencing H.W. Heinrich. He worked for the Travelers Insurance Company back in the 20s and 30s, 100 years ago and he studied uh, injuries at work. And he came up with this triangle of probability on the mathematical relationship between close calls, mishaps, and tragedies. And for those of you familiar with the work of Heinrich, you'll know I'm modifying the numbers here. I have modified them just to make them more uh, easy to understand. When a group of people who do the same or similar job have 300 close calls, just now, second out, I was a motorcycle cop back in the 70s when I was in graduate school. I was part of a group of people who did the same job, motorcycle cop. When that group of people has 300 close calls, one in 10 will end up in a mishap. Definition of a mishap, the sprain, the tear, the rip, the bruise, the fall, the cut, the impact, the property damage only event. One in 300 will end up in the big one. And by the big one, I mean death or great bodily injury. And what's the difference between death and great bodily injury? Luck. Luck. <clears throat> I recently had some involvement 
in an investigation in a tragedy in the uh, construction industry where a worker fell off a ladder, fell off backwards into rebar, into rebar that was light. And it pierced mm -hmm. his body in two locations, did not hit a bone, did not hit a vital organ. He was at work two days later. You know, mm -hmm. that was just luck. The difference between death and great model injury often gets down to luck. So what's this theory of probability all about? Heinrich said this back in the 20s. It's a good idea to learn from the deaths and great bodily injury events in your industry. When I was a motorcycle cop, any time a motorcycle cop died any place in America, I wanted to learn exactly how they died because if it happened to them, it could happen to me. We're doing the same job. That's a good idea. Heinrich takes it a step further. Would you like a better idea? The better idea would be to learn from the mishaps because they're 30 times more frequent and much less severe. The sprain, the tear, the rip, the bruise, the fall, the cut, the impact, the property damage only event. You want the best idea? The best idea would be to learn from the close call because they are 10 times more frequent than the mishaps and 300 times more frequent than the mm. fatals and no consequences at all. And that was my thesis in graduate school, was on the mathematical relationship between close calls, mishaps, and tragedies. And I focused on CHP motorcycle operations. You know what? We need to learn from these close calls, not waiting for the deaths. And finished up graduate school, <clears throat> and my thesis got approved, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, long story short, I tried to convince the CHP to use this approach uh, the program I developed was called Non-Punitive Close Call Reporting, an open forum where cops could talk about their close calls, particularly motorcycle cops, without fear of embarrassment, without fear of discipline. And I got laughed out of the room. It was just, you know, like Studebaker, I was slightly ahead of my time. I got laughed out of the room. One captain, so Graham, you're telling me that a motorcycle cop can come to me, tell me about a mistake he made, and I can't do anything about it? Well, you didn't even know about it until he told you, you know, right. you know, and his response was, that's what happens when stupid people go to school. That's what oh, happens when stupid people go to what? school. I got nowhere, but it was built into my lecture materials, my thesis in graduate school. And I said this in 1998 at a, um, a fire department seminar in uh, Pennsylvania, of all places. And a fire chief came up to me after the class. And he is physically shaking. He said, I almost vomited when you started talking about close call. I said, are you okay? He said, I am now. But a decade ago, I almost got cut in half on the fire ground. That would be a big deal, getting cut in half. He said, I missed death by less than an inch. Mm -hmm. And I've never told anybody about it because what I was doing was so stupid. I never want anybody to know that I could be that stupid. If I tell you what I did, will you share it with other firefighters? I will. Don't use my name. That's easy. I don't know your name. Don't even use my department name. That's easy. I don't know your department name. Don't even say Pennsylvania. Well, that's narrowing it down. There's only 2,315 fire departments in Pennsylvania. <laughs> that's narrowing it down. So as he's telling me his harrowing story about how we almost got cut in half, and I'm just an idiot cop. I'm getting goose pimples. Just listen to the story. This guy missed death by this much, a very violent death by this much. He leaves. Next fire chief comes up. Big guy, big mustache. Oh, that was a pretty, uh, pretty impressive story he told you there. I said, well, I think it was confidential. Hey, he told you, didn't he? Well, he did. You going to share with other firefighters? I am. How many firefighters do you talk to a year? I said, probably over a thousand. He goes, I got this thing called the secret list. You write it up <laughs> and I'll send it out tonight. And I've got several thousand firefighters on that secret list. Remember 98 email was relatively new. And I said, I'm buying you dinner. You and I need to have a chat tonight. And that was the genesis of firefighterclosecalls.com. I know. An mm. open forum where firefighters now from over 100 countries 100 countries are sharing their close calls 
because you are all part of that same industry. People who are similarly situated, you're doing the same job. A fire department in downtown Australia is the same department as downtown Los Angeles. A rural firefighter in the middle of nowhere New Zealand is the same as you have in, in nowhere USA. We need to learn from these close calls. That's step number four on my seven-step approach. Step one, better investigations. Step two, learning from investigations. Step three, learning from investigations in other high-risk industries. Step four, learning from close calls. And I'm a huge fan of firefightercloscalls.com and firefighternearness.com. Uh, Billy Goldfeder and I helped the IAFC build firefighternearness.com in 2005. Same idea. Let's talk about these close calls, these near misses, because those are problems lying in the way. Step five, institutional knowledge leaving your department. So just being very blunt here, if it offends somebody, I apologize. Obviously, I'm not talking about you. But give me 100 firefighters. And I've been on the fire department lecture circuit for over 40 years. I've learned some things. Give me 100 firefighters in a row from the same department. What I've learned in 40 years is 10 of them don't want to be there. 10 of them do not want to be there. You're wasting my time with this. Some idiot cop coming in, talking about this stuff. What's he know? Da, 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 da. 80, 85 of that 100 are good people who will do what they're told. And then there's five, maybe 10, who want to change the world. I like to call these people the bow thrusters, the people who can change that direction of that big ship with very little input because they've got some influence in the organization. Those people there, you know who they are. Everybody watching this, and, and by the way, the people who usually watch these uh, webinars and these podcasts, they're part of that 5 to 10% that's, already. That's them. The yep. 80, maybe, the 10% yep. who don't care, they're not going to watch these things. Nope. So the majority of you are those people who can make this change. You know, we have got to go back and identify who these people are and catch them before they leave. Hey, Mary, Chief, understand you're leaving us in December. Yep, 31 December is my last day, Chief, my last day. Mary, I got an assignment for you for your last six months. Um, you served as a firefighter for eight years, and then you went to paramedic school. You were a paramedic firefighter for 10 years, and then you moved into the rank of captain, supervising firefighter paramedics. And I've always liked your work. You're one of those people who really cares. What I'd like you to do in your last six months is to take the three most critical events you handle as a firefighter, as a paramedic firefighter, and as a company officer. How did you handle that event then? And I know the way you think, Mary. I know the way you think, John. If you got involved in it again, how would you do it better next time? And that's the way smart people think. If I ever am exposed to this again, this is the way I'm going to do it. It's going to be better. These people capture that information before they leave. These are the three most important things I did as a firefighter, as a paramedic firefighter, as a company officer. Here were my lessons learned. And put these into three to five little minute vignettes. And every time we come back from a break in a training day, let's show one of these things. It's three minutes. Nice. Oh, this is firefighter Mary Smith. She passed away two years ago. But 18 years ago when she was active, she had this experience. She wants to share it with you and how I did it, how I do it better next time, how I do it better next time. Capture these people before they leave. That is step five, downloading the informational knowledge, institutional knowledge from the good people leaving the organization, which brings us to step six. Now that she's gone, why don't we try to bring her back? Now we've captured her on the way out the door, but these people, they still have this institutional knowledge. I mentioned this in my live lectures. The greatest sergeant in the history of the California Highway Patrol, in my opinion, was Sergeant Jack Becker. And I was fortunate to work for him for most of my career as a motorcycle cop. This guy got it. I learned later on that he had been offered many promotional opportunities. Nope, I don't want to promote. I love working with the new kids. And he was that friend, that mentor, that trainer. I could tell you story after story after story about uh, Jack Becker. I'll bore you with one story. I retired in 2006. Prior to COVID, Mrs. Graham and I would go out to dinner and regularly people coming up, hey, Gordon, hey, how you doing? You probably don't remember me, 
I, I'm sorry, I don't. I worked for you in 1983, sir. When I was a brand new cop, you were my first sergeant. And I was telling my wife at dinner, that's Sergeant Graham. That's the best sergeant in the history of the California Highway Patrol. Well, I wouldn't go that far, son. I did the best I could. But we got some great women and men out there. No, sir, not true. You were the only sergeant who used to regularly walk us out to our motorcycle at the end of shift and thank us for a good day's work. Seriously? That's nice. So I worked in three different CHP offices as the motorcycle cop. You were the only sergeant who ever did it, and you regularly did it. So you have no idea how much that meant to me. Now, how do I learn to do that? Because I'm some sort of a genius? Nope. Jack Becker. One okay. night, 11 o'clock, I'm finishing up some paperwork. I got a beer on the job. Gordon, headed home? Yes, sir. Let me walk you out to your motorcycle. Oh, oh yeah. this is not going to be good. He just, he's probably going to beat me up. He doesn't want any witnesses. You know, we're walking down the hallway. Gordon, I don't get the chance to thank you often enough. For what? And another day's work, son. My gosh, 27 citations today, Graham. Had two felony arrests. Every time I see you sitting in briefing, I know I'm going to get a good day's work out of you, son. Now, you be careful on the way home, and I'll see you tomorrow. And remember, you're an important part of afternoon shift. That is gold. That That's is gold. Gold. That's gold. The number one complaint I get from cops, firefighters around the world uh, is... The only time I hear from my boss is when something's wrong. Well, riddle me this, Batman. Do your people do a heck of a lot more right than they ever do wrong? Catch your people doing something right and take the time to document it. If you don't get anything else out of our time together today, catch your people doing something right and ratify that good behavior. Pat them on the back in front of their peers and then document it. Because right now, we're only looking for the bad. And that's just so much negativity. Yeah. When we talk about retention, which is the other side of recruitment, I am convinced we could retain people if we had a more positive attitude in the workplace. I had a long conversation with Dr. David Black, the founder of Cortico, C-O-R-D-I-C-O, -O, a great mental health company. If you have never visited their site, at least take a look at it. Cortico. And he said, Gordon, you worked the street for 20 years. What was the most stressful thing you did in 20 years? You know what? I thought about that before. It wasn't the dead bodies. It wasn't the dead babies. It wasn't the murder victims. It wasn't the people who were 200 feet long because they were a pedestrian on the freeway. No, it was stupid bosses who at the start of shift always criticized, at the end of shift always criticized. You go out and do great stuff. I made five felony arrests in one day. For any cop, that's a big deal. To me, that was huge. And my captain called me in and gave me a dime and said, if you want to be a felony cop, you need to join Los Angeles Police Department. Here's a dime. Call them. We don't do that. Whoa. Then, now, today, the story's changed. But back then, that's devastating. Catch your people doing something right and take the time to document it. Bring back the best of the best. Tell, train, mentor, and develop the newest generation of supervisors, the newest generation of detectives, the newest generation of arson investigators, the newest generation of great people who are going to do that job. That is step six. And finally, Step seven, we need to take all of this and put it into a learning management system where every day when people log on, there will be a training bulletin specific to their job, specific to their type of department, specific to what they do, focusing on a core critical task. So Gordon, what's a core critical task? Of the thousand things you do in your job in the fire service, there's about 10 that I call core critical tasks. Long definition, very risky, done very rarely with no time to think. Core critical tasks. Every day we need to train on core critical tasks. And not just any core critical task, but the core critical tasks specific to the endpoint user who is logging on. So that is my seven-step approach. I've got a commitment from the good people at Lexapol. Gordon, use our time, use our resources to build that. But that's the big thing that I'm working on today is making the knowledge management, excuse me, learning management system in the aviation community look like chump change, a first-class learning management system for the law enforcement and fire side of things, focusing on those core critical tasks, making every day a training day. So there's the answer to that question. And being a good lawyer, I spent almost an hour talking about it. <laughs> it was fantastic. And it's just... Um...
that's a that's a hell of a legacy project. Well, you know, God willing, I'll be able to finish it up and do some beta testing and get this thing working and fine tuning it. But it's critical to me because I'm fed up with these uh, deaths and injuries. You know, it just, you know, of course, the lawsuits and those issues, in my mind, they're secondary. Our primary mission is preservation of life and not just the lives of the women and men who live in our respective communities, but also lives of the women and men who work for us in the organization. And what better way to do that than to make every day a training day focusing on those core critical tasks based on what we've learned from uh, prior investigations, uh, close calls, prior investigations in other high-risk industries, institutional knowledge leaving, institutional knowledge coming back, and making every day a training day. It's fantastic. And uh, just, I can't thank you enough for sharing this today and for sharing some of your experiences with Chief Brunacini. Um, he's always been my mentor from afar, um, as are, as is you. And you know, I noticed, if I may be so bold, you, you referenced a lot of books over this past hour. And, and I think almost an eighth step in there is be a reader. Be a reader. I mean, you, you referenced a lot of books. And, you know, I don't know if we're as, as avid. I mean, there's pockets of it in, our, in the fire service. If we're as avid a reader as we could be. But that willingness and desire, I guess it's part of being a lifelong learner for sure. But, you know, I know you have a list of books that you recommend. But that that aspect of reading and, and thinking as you're reading obviously has worked well for you. I think it can work well for all of us. When you download my reading list, you'll be surprised because the first two paragraphs are entitled How to Read a Book. Mm. How to Read a Book. You know, many times I will buy a book on Kindle and I'll love it so much that I'll buy the hard copy of it right? so that I can reread the book and do what I love to do. Yellow highlighter and folding back pages, you know, so that when I reread the book, I know exactly where to go, what caught my eye the first time. You know, oddly right. enough, I, I, I am on the University of Virginia staff. Um, and for those of you interested in this, they have a Master of Public Safety program at University of Virginia. And it's, pra uh, excuse me, it's a uh, Master of Public Safety. I have an elective course I teach in there, Practical Application for Risk Management in Public Safety Operations. If you have any interest, take a look at it. Nice. The two books that I use in that program are Going Pro, The Deliberate Practice of Professionalism by Dr. Tony Kern and Risk by General Stanley McChrystal. And I have probably read the Kern book now 30, 40 times because every time prior to class, I reread the chapters I've assigned the students. And I don't know whether it's because of my age or memory loss or what, but every time I pick up a different variation of the nugget that I wanted to talk about, you know, so reading and rereading books. I got a buddy in Ohio who's the chief of police. He gave a sergeant's test for 20 cops. They took the test. He called them all in and he had scripted questions. He asked them all the same questions. One of the questions, what was the last nonfiction book you read? 18 out of 20 said, I don't read 18 out of 20, two said Harry Potter. Now I made that up. I made that up. But 18 out of 20, I don't read. Come on now. Come on now. When you get to Dr. Kern's book and he talks about the six steps to making excellence in the norm method deviation, it's professional engagement. You've got to read these final reports. You've got to read reports. You've got to read books. You know, I make it easy for you. I read the books. And out of every 20 books I read, one of them gets on my reading list. One of them gets on my reading list. The most recent one is Risk by General Stanley McChrystal. Brilliant book on risk. And he takes his military experiences and ties them in to your day-to-day -day operations in the fire service and other high-risk industries. Fascinating. But start reading, folks. Yeah, Get a book just... of the month club. Get a book of the quarter club. You might be the chief. Get a reading program. Yep. And, you, and your list can be found on Lexapol's website? Lexapol.com forward slash presentations. Okay, or check, check drop that me out. an email at gram at lexapol.com and I'll get it out to you. That's awesome. Yeah, reading, right? And then marking up a book too. That's it, that's not sacrilege to mark up a book. You, you need to be doing it. Yep. And you know, if you want to ease people into it, we talked about this in our pre-brief. Uh, if you want to ease people into reading, go pick up go pick up uh, one of Michael Connolly's books in the Bosch series. Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> I have to, <clears throat> I'm cheating now. But for years, I'd read two business books and one pleasure book. It's now reversed. It's I'm old. 
It's two pleasure books and one business book. But you, you know, I, I boy, the Bosch series is just excellent. What a it wordsmith! Is. And sure. for those of you really into this, the ultimate wordsmith is Wilbur Smith. Uh, he passed away recently, and you can tell that there's now somebody else trying to mirror her, mirror his approach uh, on how to write books. They, uh, you know, uh, encouraged by Wilbur Smith. You can tell it's not the it's not the Wilbur Smith. But my gosh, that guy is the, the wordsmith of all times. He writes about Africa. And I know you have no interest in Africa. If you read his books, you'll want to visit Africa. Uh, my daughter, my daughter uh, spent uh, a few months there. Yep. So, yep. well, um, sir, you are a godsend to our business and to our industry. And I'm grateful that you had the time to uh, spend with us today. Um, I look forward to reconnecting with you again. Um, it was fun talking with you. It always is. Um, it was fun that we have a, something in common in, in our in our reading life. And uh, I just, I thank you. And to all of you watching this, good luck, good health, goodbye. God bless you. God bless America. And please keep your soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, and Coast Guard personnel in your prayers tonight. Without them right now, this nation would be in a much bigger mess. And let's all go back and inculcate real risk management in everything we do. Thanks again, Tom, for the invitation. See you soon. All right, Gordon. Thank you so much.